Early before sunrise on the morning of October 24, 1841, a Latter-day Saint apostle named Orson Hyde crossed the Kidron Valley and the Brook Cedron and ascended up onto the Mount of Olives, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. At great sacrifice, Hyde had traveled for dozens of months, all the way from America and across Europe to arrive at this very moment, a moment that had been prophesied he would fulfill years earlier by the prophet Joseph Smith. Shortly after Hyde's conversion to the church, Hyde remembered that Joseph Smith, quote, laid his hands upon my head and pronounced these remarkable words, in due time thou shalt go to Jerusalem, the land of thy fathers, and be a watchman unto the house of Israel, and by thy hands shall the Most High do a good work, which shall prepare the way and greatly facilitate the gathering together of that people." End of quote. Sometime after this, Orson Hyde had a vision that lasted six hours where he saw himself traveling across the globe to preach the gospel and ultimately to visit and dedicate the Holy Land in Jerusalem. Now in 1841, he was finally there, and with paper and pen in hand, he solemnly dictated a prayer to dedicate the Holy Land. Hyde prayed, quote, Now, O Lord, thy servant has been obedient to the heavenly vision which thou gavest him in his native land, and under the shadow of thine outstretched arm, he has safely arrived in this place to dedicate and consecrate this land unto thee for the gathering together of Judah's scattered remnants, according to thy predictions of thy holy prophets. Incline them to gather in upon this land according to thy word." End of quote. When Elder Hyde offered that dedicatory prayer, there were likely fewer than 5,000 Jewish people in the entire land of Palestine. Today, there are over 2 million, and they have literally come from the four corners of the earth in fulfillment of the prophecies of the Lord and his servants. Today, there is also a beautiful garden dedicated to the spot where this historic event took place called the Orson Hyde Memorial Garden. Professor David Whitchurch of BYU's Department of Ancient Scripture has spoken at a BYU devotional on this subject and has recently published an article on Orson Hyde and the church's presence in the Holy Land. One of the motivations to do this research is we would take our students every semester to the Orson Hyde Memorial Gardens that's on the Mount of Olives. And we would talk about Orson Hyde. We would talk about his mission. We'd talk about the dedication of that garden in, uh, let's see, 1979 by President Spencer W. Kimball. When I got home, I was asked to speak at the devotional. I, I started to think there has to be more to this story. And that's really what has prompted me to engage in this research, and it's been a long journey. In today's episode, David Whitchurch takes us on what he's learned on this long journey of his studies about the long journey of Orson Hyde to dedicate the Holy Land, and also the church's long journey to establish the BYU Jerusalem Center overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. I'm your host, Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Brad Wilcox sat down with his ancient scripture colleague, Professor David Whitchurch, to discuss his BYU Studies publication on the restored Church of Jesus Christ in the Holy Land and Apostle Orson Hyde's role in dedicating the Holy Land in particular. As you know, Why Religion has three parts, and in part one, we like to look at why this study was done and the information and insights gained from it. So in this first part, Dr. Whitchurch will discuss Orson Hyde's conversion and his long and inspiring journey and short but impactful mission to the Holy Land. 
He'll also discuss Orson Hyde's prayer to dedicate the Holy Land and how a memorial garden was established to remember it, and also how the BOU Jerusalem Center miraculously came to be. So here is Brad Wilcox with Professor David Whitchurch. Today I'm with David Whitchurch. David and I have been colleagues at religious education for years, but more important, we've been friends for many years. I think we first met when we were working together in a calling, in our callings in the YSA stake at Heritage Halls. Do you remember that? I do. I remember it well. I have been anticipating this chance to talk to you because I have been fascinated with this line of research that you've been following for years. Research about Orson Hyde, the Holy Land, the Jerusalem Center, Brigham Young University's presence there in the Holy Land. But the one piece I want to do today is a beautiful summary of your research based on a devotional that you did here at BYU. And uh, I'd love to just go back and revisit this because you had just returned. You and Tina, your wife, had just returned from BYU Jerusalem Center where you had spent three years. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, It was a great experience. It was very intense. Uh, The original assignment from Brigham Young University was a two-year assignment. We had been over there a number of times. Our first trip to the Holy Land was in 1984. And you'd been over to teach or you'd been over to research? The first trip came when we were teaching seminary. I was young and just getting started in uh, CES, uh, church education system. And uh, they were offering some educational travel to go to the Holy Land and Egypt and Italy. And uh, we— Just all that, ju- all that New Testament, a, Old Testament yeah, Old history. Testament. My wife and I participated in that. And when we got to the Holy Land, there was something that ignited that said this is a special place. And I kind of kept that in the back of my mind for, for years. And then when I was hired by BYU— um, we went over and uh, taught as faculty there back in 1995, 1996, and then several other times. And then they had asked uh, my wife and I to go over in the administration in so 2013. Did you help, help run the center? Uh, we were the associate director responsible for the overseeing the academic program, it was a large part of the assignment. And uh, it was a two year assignment initially, and then they asked us to stay a third year, so 2013, 2016, just after we got home, uh, exhausted, tired, just on the go. You know what it's like. You've served as mission president, uh, and this isn't a mission. It was an assignment from BYU, but just exhausting pace, and came back ready to... We had sold our home before we left. We'd sold our cars Before we left, we thought, well, we'll be gone long enough. We were looking for a new home, looking for cars, uh, get settled. And then the university called and said, would you mind uh, doing the devotional? (laughs) So that's what you're reading from is that— that uh, You said, sure, in all my spare time. I I said, well, I had spare time, but I really wasn't looking to engage back on campus for a little bit. (laughs) Well, you know, the interesting thing is that you've been over there so often that now you could call it a second home, but you felt that before you had been there. In the devotional, you said the minute the plane touched down on the tarmac in Tel Aviv, I felt like I had come home to see a long lost family member. The emotions were intense and unanticipated. Just that feeling of, I've come home, and that was the first time you'd landed in the country. I can still remember when that plane landed there in in Tel Aviv, and I I had taught from the Bible. I taught students for years prior to that. Uh, I loved the scriptures, all of them, but uh, had spent a lot of time focusing on the Old and the New Testament in my career. And when we landed, there was just an immediate connection yeah. I felt the same thing when I went over for the first time. And I think, I kept thinking, am I feeling this because the Savior was here? Am I feeling this because this is where the scriptures unfolded? And then I thought, it might be more than that, because as you consider our lineage in the house of Israel, we truly are going home. Yeah. Yeah. And Orson Hyde felt this. He he did. I, I, I think you probably have it there in front of you. I I. 
printed a copy before I left of this just to review a few things. And I, when Orson Hyde actually landed, landed. Uh, yeah, he wasn't on he a plane. Took a, he took a ship. Uh, but when he gets there, he describes his experience as he comes into that land. Let me just share it with you. He said uh, this is, he gets there on a Thursday. It's October 21st. He's only in the Holy Land for four days. Most people don't realize how. Yeah, even though the trip took under just under he's, three years. He, he's 32 months in getting there and getting back home, and there's a whole lot to that story. But he said, as I gazed, this is as he's coming into the Holy Land, coming up from the coast, uh, uh, landed at Jaffa. As I gazed upon it and its environs, the mountains and hills by which it is surrounded, and considered that this is the stage upon which so many scenes of wonders have been acted, where prophets were stoned and the Savior of sinners slain, a storm of commingled emotions suddenly arose in my breast, the force of which was only spent in a profuse shower of tears. And I, 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 I've gone back and looked at church leaders and others that have had similar experiences um, when they arrive in the Holy Land, there's just something that is special that you connect with when you get there. Let's talk a little bit more about Orson Hyde himself. I, we'll, we'll talk about his travels because he left from Nauvoo and then gets to Jerusalem. And by the time he goes over and back, it takes him just under three years. But I think even more important than the journey were the feelings that he had before the journey and the things that Joseph Smith said to him. Tell us a little bit about his conversion, Orson Hyde. Um, I'd love to. He, he was born in Oxford, Connecticut um, when he was seven years old. His mother passed away. He comes from a family of 12 children and uh, a shock to the entire family. His father was in the War of 1812 and not home very much. And with the death of his mother, the children were, I hate to use the term farmed out, but really went to different neighbors in the community. Now, did his dad survive the war? He, his, his dad did, and then later uh, drowned when he was younger. So he, he had a hard life, and he, he grew up in a home, uh, you know, age seven on with a farmer that was very demanding. Uh, the farmer eventually, when he was 14 years old, moved to Kirtland. This is before the, the church. The farmer or Orson Hyde? The, the farmer who took Orson Hyde. They walked from Oxford, Connecticut to uh, uh, Kirtland, Ohio. You can kind of see and God's as hand a, in that. As a 14-year-old. And this yeah. is before the church had established itself or had a presence in Kirtland. And just uh, opportunities that the farmer was looking for and took Orson Hyde there. Uh, he... He actually joined uh, a church, the Campbellites. Most that's uh, what Sidney heard. Rigdon was doing, and, and Sidney Rigdon had a large role in his conversion, and uh, worked as a clerk there in Kirtland at a store, and then eventually uh, had enough school and training that he went out to preach the gospel, not as a member of the church, but as a uh, Campbellite. You know, what's interesting to me is talking about seeing his hand and the fact that God was bringing him to the Kirtland area, but the store oh. that he was working at was the Whitney store, Gilbert and Whitney store. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, and his conversion is one of preaching for the Campbellites. And when, when he first gets word of the Book of Mormon, he reads part of it, and then he says, wait a minute, I, this can't be... True, and it's not till later Sidney Rigdon joins the church, and he says, "I need to study this out for myself." I think so many people have that quick impression of the book, and it's only as you look deeper that you start realizing, no, this there is more to this, and we can't just simply dismiss it with a a quick cursory reading, um, and then say, "Oh, it's got to be fiction." And it was that intense desire to find out that that conflict between Sidney Rigdon joining the church and his own efforts to preach in the Campbellite faith that caused him to step away for a bit and really study those scriptures. And as he did, he gained a 
testimony of the restored gospel. Well, once he was converted, was it Orson Hyde who felt the promptings to go to Israel, or was that Joseph Smith who told him, kind of prophesied that he would go to Israel? You know, as I've been researching Orson Hyde, there are a series of events that take place that get him to the Holy Land. And it starts off uh, almost at the very beginning of his conversion when he's uh, when he joins the church, when he's set apart for the apostleship in 1835, called by the three witnesses, uh, the, the first quorum of 12 apostles. And as Oliver Cowdery is uh, blessing him, he makes reference to the gathering, the gathering of the Jews, that he'll play a role there. He later has a blessing by Joseph Smith, who makes similar comments. Uh, and it's 1840 that he's now in Nauvoo, Illinois, and he's had a series of events. There are some real struggles that Orson Hyde goes through within the church. Uh, uh, and not to get into all of those challenges, but uh, he he really got himself into some hot water with an affidavit when Thomas B. Marsh uh, signed an affidavit with what was going on in Missouri uh, against Joseph Smith, against the church. Um, Elder Hyde was part of that. It didn't take him too long to realize that he had made a mistake, a major mistake, and one quickly thing reversed himself. I mean, I mean, there's repentance and action. I've always admired that because he was one who would repent quickly and get back on track, while others would spend years and years and years out of the church. He would recognize when he did something wrong and then turn around. And, and I think the real mission to the Holy Land, um, I, 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 I'm sure there were times when he would think about it with these early blessings and comments by Joseph Smith. But in 1840, he's in Nauvoo. He's not feeling very well. And he said he goes to bed, uh, this is in March of 1840, and the timing is actually pretty important when we look at Orson Hyde's life. Uh, he, he, instead of going to sleep, he has a six-hour, he, he describes it as a six-hour vision. And he sees himself in this vision traveling to the Holy Land, specific cities in New York and Amsterdam and Constantinople, and sees himself in Jerusalem. So that's March, and then in April of 1840 is a conference, probably... Kind of a general it, conference. It is a general conference with, uh, I, I've seen estimates of two, 3,000 people in attendance there just off the hill where the temple, the Nauvoo Temple's being built, and it, it, they ask him to speak, and he gets up and talks about this experience that he has had, this vision and as he makes reference to it and concludes that talk, um, Joseph Smith gets up right afterwards and he says to all those present, I propose that we call Elder Orson Hyde on a mission to Jerusalem. Right. All in favor, oh raise your hand. Goodness, just right over the pulpit. <laughs> right over the pulpit. And hands go up and a couple of days later, he, uh, Joseph gets up after Elder John E. Page also has spoken, and he said, I propose that John E. Page be his companion. And and that's that's mid-April. Uh, I guess I, I take that back. That's April 6th uh, that that takes place. And one week later, Orson Hyde and John E. Page are leaving Nauvoo, leaving their families behind. Uh, what a challenge for both of them. Now, Elder they Page leave. doesn't make the entire journey. They spend the first 10 months of their mission um, raising funds and pretty much traveling through the eastern United States to church congregations, selling pamphlets and brochures. Uh, Joseph Smith has now written in, uh, in the church paper at the time uh, about this mission. It quickly spreads to all the members and said, please support them and raising these, but 10 months they're going from congregation to congregation, and they end up uh, ultimately deciding to go two different directions to increase their their funding that they desperately need to travel so far around the world. And Elder Page uh, ends up not meeting Orson 
Hyde, who's in now, after 10 months, he's in New York. And Joseph Smith actually publishes in the paper. He, he specifically says, uh, I'm calling John E. Page and Orson Hyde to repent and get on their way. <laughs> and, and Elder Hyde sees that and he just goes, what do I do? I, uh, Elder Page isn't here. I'm here. I, the ship's right there in New York Harbor. And, and he quickly gets a, a ticket ranges to travel to England which he does at uh, Liverpool, and it does so without, high, uh, without Page, hoping that Page will catch up to him uh, when he gets over to England. And, and Page, for various reasons, uh, it just doesn't ever make it. But isn't it interesting that, I mean, here's a public rep- reprimand. He didn't send him a letter and say, no. get, get on the <laughs> stick. No. He sends, I mean, he writes in the paper, when you see this, you better get on the move. And that's exactly, I, I, I can't... Imagine what Elder Hyde must have been feeling when he sees that and that need to move forward. But think of the think of the urgency that Joseph was feeling. I mean, this is 1840. Joseph knows that there's things that have to be done here in the next few years. He knows his time is getting shorter. That's right. And so there is this urgency. He doesn't care about offending somebody, he wants to get the work done. He does, and I I think Joseph Smith certainly uh, saw the bigger picture of the gathering in the last days, and and certainly something that we will um, touch on, I'm sure, as we visit more with President Nelson and others. I think every prophet has focused on the gathering of the House of Israel in the last days, and I'm sure he was feeling that as he said, you need to move to that next level, which is get out of the United States. So it's now a, it's now February 1841 when Elder Hyde makes arrangements to go over to England. Well, before we get him over to Europe, tell us about the miracle that happened in Philadelphia. Well, that's a great story. I'm glad you bring that one up. And I, and, and I love it for two reasons. So having spent so much time in Jerusalem, uh, one of the one of the motivations to do this research is we would take our students every semester to the Orson Hyde Memorial Gardens that's on the Mount of Olives, and we would talk about Orson Hyde. We would talk about his mission. We'd talk about the dedication of that garden in, uh, let's see, 1979 by President Spencer W. Kimball. Wow with half of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve present and, uh, and thousands of others, mostly members of the church there at that dedication of the, the Orson Hyde Gardens. And we would talk to the students about the story of Orson Hyde. And yet after reading everything that I could about it, I didn't have time while I was there, but when I got home, I was asked to speak at the devotional. I, I started to think there has to be more to this story. And that's really what has prompted me to engage in this research. And it's been a long journey, a longer journey than I ever anticipated. Uh, COVID has been a challenge. In fact, I, I'll i just put this out there now. But when COVID started, um, March in 2020, if I can yep. remember that date, and um, I started to think in terms of some of Orson Hyde's experiences that he wrote about, and I knew that Orson Hyde had been in quarantine on that trip to the Holy Land. In fact, 34 days he was in quarantine. And, and in Italy, he was in quarantine. In Egypt, he was in quarantine. He was going through health stations when he got into the Ottoman Empire. Just like we see today. So what we lived through is not <laughs> unlike what he was oh, going through. It's exactly what he went through. And so I decided I would do a, a little research on that and with COVID and teaching online and everything that uh, we, that all of the changes that that demanded, it's taken me a lot longer to get through some of this research. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you stuck with but it. it. But it, and it's still going. I, I hope we get that uh, published here and in the next few months, uh, the Orson Hyde in quarantine, I think we'll call it. <laughs> that, the, and it's probably a little behind the curve, you know, as we start seeing some uh, things settling down a little bit with 
with quarantines and COVID, and hopefully that will continue to get better. That will be better. so interesting for you to draw, uh, make those connections. It's, it's been really fun. Well, let's go back to Philadelphia <laughs> sure. because okay, there's thank something you for that. happens there that's a turning point. So raising the fund, uh, getting those funds in place were really, really important and how to um, how to finance that trip. And you can imagine that the, the majority of the church is localized in eastern United States. And most of the money that they're getting uh, would be coming from members of the church. But w- when... Elder Hyde, Elder Page would go into an area where a congregation would, they'd be speaking, and they would speak to whoever would listen. And so in these public meetings, and they would tell about this call to go to the Holy Land uh, for the gathering of the House of Israel. And in Philadelphia, uh, Elder Hyde didn't even know the name of the individual, not a member of the church. Uh, It turns out much, much later the name is Joseph Beck, and I, and I love the story in part because my son-in-law is named Joseph Beck, who happens to be a direct descendant of this person that was listening to Elder Hyde in Philadelphia and who uh, went home and then sent his son back. Now, there are different family versions of this story, and I've been gathering those along the way, and I'm not sure which is the... Act, most accurate version, but uh, from what I can gather, sends a, a son back to Philadelphia to give Orson Hyde a, a, a bag of gold, a gold coin, I suspect. And that is a major, major impact on his ability to get over to the Holy Land and travel. Once you get to Europe, his fundraising is very limited. The English saints that are converting they're don't very have poor. very much. And once you leave England, there are no members of the church beyond that. And so this, uh, this experience that he has from Joseph Beck in, in Philadelphia uh, ends up to be a tremendous blessing. What does Joseph Beck ask for in return? For he the says, remember my name. And so we literally see in the prayer Orson Hyde remembering the name of the individual who gave him the money, but he doesn't mention the name because he doesn't know it. Yeah, I think it's great. I'll (laughs) read it here. Look with favor upon all those through their liberality. I have been enabled to come to this land. Particularly, do thou bless the stranger in Philadelphia. (laughs) There it is. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Now, later you say that it was Nephi Morris who was speaking in 1924 about this and I still didn't know the name. Yeah. And then somebody in the congregation came up and said, that was my father. And so the story is, is that Joseph uh, Beck converts to the church. His wife is, was already a member, so there was a connection there. And then they they end up moving with the saints. Tell us West. about a very special thing that you arranged on the day you gave this devotional. <laughs> um, I thought this was classic. It, you know, it, it turns out when I when I would go over to the Holy Land, uh, we would take the students into the place where Orson Hyde stayed for the few days that he was there, a, a church called um, uh, Terra Santa or St. Savior's. And they had a place for pilgrims. And when Orson Hyde got there to the Holy Land, uh, he met some Protestant missionaries that helped arrange for him to stay there. He paid the money that it cost for the rooming, uh, for the room. And uh, we would take our students to that church. And it wasn't unusual for someone to be a descendant of Orson Hyde. And I would often just say, are there any of you who are descendants when we would get our group of students there to talk to them. And on one occasion, uh, it was uh, Nate Hyde. Mm-hmm. He raised his hand and he said, yeah, my grandpa came to the Holy Land, great, great, I don't know how many greats. Uh, and, and he told of his experience. And he specifically made reference that his favorite part of the story was the man giving the money to help him get to the Holy Land. And uh, when I spoke here at BYU, I arranged to have uh, Joseph Beck, my son-in-law offer one of the prayers, and I had Nate uh, Hyde offer the other prayer, uh, the 
can't remember who gave the opening and who gave the closing, but, but there's those just that connection, the descendants of Joseph Beck and Orson Hyde uh, coming together during that devotional. Oh, I love that. Now, he actually gives the prayer, the dedication prayer, on October 24th, 1841. And he hikes up, away from the city, he hikes up the Mount of Olives kind of, that kind of overlooks the city. And then he either offers this prayer and writes it down. And he says, uh, you know, we dedicate and consecrate this land unto thee for the gathering together of Judah's scattered remnants, according to the predictions of the holy prophets. Wow, this was at a time that was long, long before Jews began to gather there to Israel, uh, returning to what they called their homeland. And it's just remarkable that clear back in 1841, he was dedicating the land to this purpose. Yeah, it, it really, when he gets to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is under uh, the uh, part of the Ottoman Empire. It's a bit run down. It hasn't had a lot of attention in recent years. It's kind of on the periphery of uh, the Ottoman Empire. There have been conflicts between Egypt and breaking away from the Ottoman Empire for a time, and then the Ottoman Empire coming back and pulling Egypt back into its realm for a bit. And so a lot of tensions uh, that had taken place when he gets there. Uh, it's during a heat uh, wave, uh, miserable weather conditions that he experiences when he's there. He's tired from his travels. And for him to take pen and paper, get up early in the morning on a Sunday morning and get to the city gate that's closed and has to wait until the light of day when they open it and for him to walk that half mile or so to the top of the Mount of Olives and pen and paper in hand. I've, I've wondered, I, I have to believe he sat down and wrote out the prayer and then he offered the prayer. I don't know the order, but I would believe that it would be write it down first and then offer Which the is, prayer that we have now, yeah, and now recorded. That's what <clears throat> prophets do with sure. dedications of temples. Sure. Write those write out in out. advance. Um, now, today, in the place where he dedicated the land, there's a beautiful garden. It wasn't there back then. It was kind of just this desert. But now there's a beautiful garden there. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the church and church members. Tell us a little bit about the Orson Hyde Memorial Gardens. Well, it's a project that uh, uh, t the mayor at the, in the day in the 70s had approached the BYU, some BYU people that were there and asked about the possibility. They knew the story of Orson Hyde uh, coming to the Holy Land. Uh, they knew a little bit about that prayer, dedicatory prayer that he offered. And they asked if the church would be interested in beautifying the, a portion of the Mount of Olives just on the east side of the old city. And uh, with discussions uh, rising to the right level, <laughs> there was a major fundraising effort to take place uh, and uh, an endowment established. Uh, the Orson Hyde uh, endowment was uh, in... in in put in place in order to finance the beautification of that property. To this day, it's, it's, it's owned by the municipality. So they set an endowment to perpetually care for that property. So it's owned, it's owned by the municipality there. In the, so the caretakers, in caretakers that are caretakers. there are getting paid, but they're not being paid through the church. No, no, no. No, and, and in fact, the church doesn't own it, even though we have a sign there that talks about the dedication of that that took place on October 24th. It was on the anniversary of 1979. And so still people go there and have a chance, a, a very uh, quiet garden. And, um, and it overlooks the, Gethsemane. It does overlook, uh, it, it overlooks the old city there and uh, and Gethsemane is just right next by next yeah. next to it's it. It's a beautiful beautiful setting. It is. I love it. It is. Now it's not far. It, actually if you go from the garden and you go north along the 
the hillside along the, the mountain, then you get to the Jerusalem Center. That's but right. That wasn't always there either. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about how we ended up with the Jerusalem Center. Well, in, in 1967, uh, there was the what is typically referred to as the Six-Day War, and, and a lot of history and a lot of politics go into this. Uh, um, but uh, soon after that Six-Day War, the uh, Brigham Young University wanted to establish a uh, not not a presence as much as they wanted to provide an opportunity for students to go to the Holy Land and to uh, study the scriptures and uh, get acquainted with the sites and come to know the Savior better. They're still doing it to this day and have a dormitory that's <laughs> safe and protected and. And, and to have a, a beautiful classrooms to study in. And, and so it didn't start, it started small. They were in different hotels and different places, Ramat Rahel, they ended up there for a time. Uh, but as the program grew, it was obvious that they needed to have a more permanent place. And so uh, as they uh, approached Brigham Young University, as Brigham Young University approached the church, received permissions to build a building, we're now in the 1980s, uh, a site was selected. Uh, it was actually the dedication of the Orson Hyde Garden that President Kimball was then taken on tour and Eldon Tanner was there, others were there, and they identified a half a dozen possible places to build uh, a Jerusalem center. Um, and uh, as they took President Kimball around, the stories told that uh, as he looked at the different sites, uh, ultimately they took them, him up on the Mount of Olives and you could see the old city. And I think the view wasn't quite what he had hoped for. And so he walked along the, the mountainside there, the hillside. And uh, as he got to a spot where you could look out over the old city, he said, I propose this is the place. And, and the story is, is that President Kimball said all those in favor, and they've got this small, relatively small group, but a number of people there. Uh, raise your hand, and so he took a hands page, went up. He took a page out of <laughs> out of uh, Joseph Smith's book, <laughs> calling Orson Hyde over there. I guess that's at the true. Very beginning. I had never made that connection, but I guess that's really right. And and then to find out that that land was really not uh, a piece of property that would be easily. Well, it had obtained. been sown green belt. That's right. It was green belt, and it wasn't uh, intended for construction. And the process of as getting... if anything in Jerusalem is green, <laughs> but in, in spring it's green yeah. for about two weeks. <laughs> no, a little bit more than that. But, uh, but you know, people like Robert Thorne. You mention him in your writings true. as being somebody who had expertise in real estate, and he went over to try to help the church acquire this land, and what he thought would just be a couple weeks, it turned into a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. getting the right legal team together, both Palestinian and Israeli, this is disputed land, uh, to say the least at the time, and to get all of the permissions necessary to actually build. Uh, and ultimately, when they received those permissions uh, and started building it, created another stir of those that were opposed to that building being constructed. Yeah, a lot of Just opposition. A, a series of miracles in order for that building to be completed. But I think it's interesting because then when it was finally done, the mayor said, I consider this to be the most beautiful building built in Jerusalem in recent years. Yep. Dedicated by President Hunter and uh, just a there, there is such a history there, and for those that have had a chance to go to the Holy Land and, and visit the Jerusalem Center, there is a special spirit that is part of that building. For me, it, it's the views that you can sit uh, almost anywhere when you're on that property and look out over the old city and reflect and contemplate the history and the events that transpired there, not, not just those associated with our Savior, but prophet after prophet after prophet. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. 
Some of the articles that we discuss on the Why Religion podcast are often published by the Religious Studies Center in their journal that's called The Religious Educator. The Religious Educator is an academic journal whose goal is to provide carefully reviewed, inspirational, and informative articles that will benefit a broad range of Latter-day Saints who love the gospel and its teachings. It's been around now for more than 20 years. And listen to this, issues that were published over a year ago are available online full text for free. Just go to rsc.byu.edu and click on the Religious Educator link to find the past 20 plus years of excellent articles covering a broad range of gospel subjects, and also to find out how to subscribe to this journal to receive the latest articles when they come out if you're interested. Check the journal and its articles out and pick them up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Dr. David Whitchurch discuss his research on Orson Hyde and the Jerusalem Center in the Holy Land. In part two of Why Religion, we'd like to explore a little bit more about why this research matters. How can it inform us in helping us to live, learn, or love aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? In part two, Professor Whitchurch will discuss the power of the Holy Land, how we can come to know our Savior personally, whether we're ever able to visit the Holy Land or not, and he will also discuss some lessons he has learned from observing all the committed faiths in the Holy Land. Let's turn now our attention to what does this have to do with us? I mean, so we've covered some important history, some fascinating history, but what are some lessons that we can pull from this for us today? I love that question, and and I I think that's a question we ask whenever we read the scriptures, when we study church history. It's nice to know the facts, but it's more important to find ways in which we can learn from those facts and come to know our Savior better. And and for me, the Holy Land, as I've described earlier, is a special special place. I I love Jerusalem. Uh, There hasn't been a time that I've gone that I don't feel a connection to that special land. And for me, it's a way to appreciate the reality of those that walk that place. It's a way for me to recognize that the Savior lived and taught and was crucified uh, and then resurrected in that land. Yes. But but just as important as that, I've come to realize you don't have to go to the Holy Land to come to that knowledge. I, I mean, it's it's nice that you can get there, but not everyone will get there. In fact, the majority of people that are part of the restored gospel don't get that opportunity to go to the Holy Land. Um, But we do have a way whereby we can come to know our Savior as we study these scriptures, we see the reality of these places and uh, the reality of the people that live there. Yes, very true. And the testimony that they give us of our Savior. I think uh, you've probably hit the major lesson right on the head. Uh, because this is all about coming to know the Savior better. But I think one thing that sticks out to me as I look at this is that Orson Hyde, of all people, I mean, were other people having these promptings about going to dedicate the land of Israel? And yet he kept feeling these promptings. He kept having prophets tell him that he needed to do this. And I think in my own life, I can look back and see how God has just nudged me and nudged me and nudged me to do some things. Mm. And I think of you. I mean, how many faculty members are in this building, in the Joseph Smith building at BYU, and yet it's you who's done this research? So what is it that it's like God has a work for you to do, and he just keeps nudging and nudging and nudging until you do it. He's not nudging anybody else to do this research, but he keeps bothering you about it and keeps saying, you need to get this done, David. And I think that's something that even if people can't go to Israel, that's a lesson we can take away from this. Well, I I appreciate it. I appreciate your comments and uh, (laughs) the nudging to get this done. It's been a long time coming, (laughs) and every time I I engage in it, uh, I I find more 
more information, more things that I want to share. <laughs> so thank you for the reminder to get this written up. It's, it's time. You know, All in favor, it, raise your right hand. <laughs> you know, let, let me backtrack just a little bit because I, I have been so impressed as I've done this research. When Orson Hyde gets to the Holy Land, go back that far, he meets three Protestant missionaries and these are missionaries that were sent by an organization in the U.S. to, it's the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. That's a mouthful. And they, they had this same sense of gathering and, and this idea of House of Israel and preaching to the Jews. And this idea wasn't just unique to Joseph Smith. There was a feeling that existed in the United States, uh, they, there were missionaries that uh, Orson Hyde met with that uh, had been over there for 1830s. I didn't realize bef- that. Beforehand, and he met with them the day before he dedicated the Holy Land with three of these individuals. And uh, uh, they helped him find the place to stay. He had a letter of recommendation that got him there. So there's this sense, and yet Joseph Smith, he has that that calling as prophet and sees the larger picture of the gathering of Israel while they weren't doing as much missionary work as introducing the people to Christianity itself and not with the intent to convert and baptize, so to speak. We certainly see the recognition of Orson Hyde, uh, we don't proselyte in the Holy Land today, so we understand the timetable. Uh, maybe we don't understand the timetable, how that will all come about. Um, but we, we recognize this need of missionaries worldwide to preach the gospel and to bring people into and restore that understanding of who they are as children of uh, descendants of the House of Israel. Well, I think that's interesting as you bring that up. It makes me think of two additional lessons. One, Jerusalem is a place where faiths, people of different faiths work together. I didn't realize that there were people of other faiths who were over there, you know, interested in the same thing that Orson Hyde was. And and yet today you see uh, Palestinians, you see Jews, you see Christians— all kind of working together in this environment. And the key word there is kind of, because, <laughs> because they do have their conflicts and tensions, but, but there is an underlying, you know, larger picture there. And it's amazing to see the devotion of the different faiths. Uh, I, I, every time I go, I think to myself, I could learn from the commitment that I see uh, in every faith, whether it's Islam or whether it's Christian, of people that are there and their dedication as they understand uh, their relationship with God. The, yeah, there I are the lessons I can learn uh, about myself and ask myself, I, can, I could do better. So, I feel the same way every time I'm at the Western Wall And I see the Jews praying so sincerely there, and I join them, and I pray at the Western Wall. Every time I've gone, I pray at that wall. And I am impressed with their examples. I, like you, say I've got to try to do better and be a little more dedicated, but I also pray for them that one day they'll be able to... to, uh, truly participate in the gathering that President Nelson's talking about, a gathering of Israel to the church, a gathering of these children of the covenant to the covenant. And that's going to be a glorious day. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you talking about that. And, and, and I've, I've come to realize because of the complexity of that holy land, is that we stay close to the Lord and it's the Lord's timetable and there will come a day that there'll be unity of heart and mind. Well, we've we seen miracles. The Savior. Yep. We've seen miracles up to this point and I'm sure we'll see them in the future. Well, and I and I, I love the focus of President Nelson almost from the day that he was sustained as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with, with an emphasis on the gathering of the House of Israel. And, and we see that in broad context of the gathering 
of the house of Israel. If you're interested in reading all of Professor David Whitchurch's article, quote, The Restored Church of Jesus Christ and the Holy Land, end of quote, published by BYU Studies, we have provided a link to it on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. That's the letter Y, then religion.byu.edu. There we've also given a link to watch uh, David's BYU devotional called Orson Hyde, the Holy Land, and Brigham Young University, along with a link to learn more about Professor Whitchurch and his research. All right, let's move into our third part, segment three, where we like to discuss things a little bit more personally with the professor, specifically why they chose to come to BYU to be a religion professor and why they believe in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. So we conclude this great episode with Professor Whitchurch giving us insights into these two why questions. Well, let's end, David, just talking about your own personal journey. How did you come to BYU? How did you end up teaching here? And... How do you stay strong in your faith and testimony of the Restoration? Great questions. How long do we have? (laughs) You've got exactly two and a half minutes. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The primary talks that we used to give, two and a half minute talk. I can do that. Um, You know, it was a journey I hadn't anticipated. I I think for me and my colleagues here, if you talk to most of us, you find that they have their own story about coming to BYU, and mine is similar in that it wasn't my end game. Uh, I, I have a, my first degree is in wildlife science, and I was uh, teaching at the Salt Lake Mission Home. Uh, this was a calling back in the day. A mission president had recommended me to teach there, and I, my passion for teaching sort of ignited, and yet I continued on this path towards my degree in wildlife, worked for the fish and game during the summers as an intern, uh, and yet there was something about teaching in the classroom, and so uh, when well, I... Well, sometimes when I, classrooms when I, are full of wildlife. <laughs> well, okay, we won't go there, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and there really was, a, when I got married, I started thinking, you know, what's, where does the Lord want me? And, and that's the question we all need to ask. And sometimes he pushes us, and it pushes us in a direction we don't anticipate. And that was my experience. I went from wildlife getting that degree and a week later starting teaching seminary and somehow had been accepted to teach going through a a program for seminary teachers. And uh, as I started teaching seminary, that ignited interest and passions and furthering my education and eventually getting a PhD. Where did you get it? uh, Here at BYU. And uh, it it was a huge blessing. I uh, went from finishing my PhD here and they sent me up to Canada, but with an idea that I really wanted to go back to the Holy Land after I'd been there as a young seminary teacher and uh, didn't know how that would work out. And I thought, you know, they have a Jerusalem Center building now when I started thinking this way, and maybe there's a chance I could go over as an institute teacher or a religion teacher at the center. And one thing led to another, and the doors opened, and I ended up being asked to come to BYU, I showed an interest, and fortunately, very fortunately, um, they asked if I would be interested in teaching here. Well, we're glad so, that they asked, and we're glad that you accepted. Now, tell us a little bit about your own testimony. How have you been able to stay strong in your commitment to and your uh, testimony of the restored gospel? Great question. And and one I love to share, you know, I it, it's hard in the sense that I grew up in the church. My father was a convert, joined when he was in the military, World War II. He's since passed away. Both my parents have. Uh, my mother was a member. Her her ancestry takes, takes our family to William Clayton. Um, when my mother was early 20s, I suppose, I uh, my my father was in the military in California, and they met at a dance that 
was sponsored by the church for military. Uh, and she met my dad, and he was assigned in Washington, and they started writing letters, and pretty soon he joined the church, unbeknownst to my mother. And um, I grew up in that home, nine children, and they were faithful. My dad was committed to the restored gospel, so we grew up having family prayer and and trying to do the home evenings. We we did well sometimes and yeah, up and down a little with bit. With nine but, kids, but that they could be were, a problem. But <laughs> they were committed uh, to the gospel, and I grew up in that environment. And so for me personally, I don't know that I ever challenged the truthfulness of the restored gospel. It was strengthened over time with multiple experiences. I served a mission, loved the mission experience, but I had a testimony long before that. And that testimony has persevered. I I made a commitment on my mission to read my scriptures daily, and I've held to that as a personal challenge uh, to this day and spend time in those scriptures. And uh, I, I just find that, you know, you have questions that come up, but not questions that distract from the faith, questions I want to know, but with an underlying understanding and knowledge that the gospel is true, that Jesus is the Christ, that Joseph Smith saw God the Father and the Son. And, and that uh, runs deep in who I am as a son of God. And uh, it's just being faithful to that knowledge. And as matters arise and challenges confront us to stay true to those basic um, truths of Joseph Smith as a prophet that were led by living apostles and prophets to this day. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.